Hi everyone, it's Dr. Tofi. Welcome to Hurry and Talk Live, our weekly question and answer session. My name is Dr. Sharin Tofi. I am your hernia and laparoscopic surgery specialist. Many of you are joining us by Facebook as a Facebook Live at Dr. Tofi. Um, some of you follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Hernia Doc. And thanks for following me and watching and sharing everything on YouTube. At the end of the show, we will have this uh, posted on YouTube for all of you all to see. Today, we have a very great guest because we're getting a little bit outside of the typical hernias that we talk about. We have Dr. Caitlin Houghton. She is a foregut surgery specialist at USC, where I used to work, um, University of Southern California, very, very famous institution for hiatal hernias and foregut surgery in general. Um, you can follow her on Facebook at Dr. Houghton or on Twitter, Kate Houghton13. And please give a warm welcome to Dr. Houghton. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Good. So many of people on the show already know, my first job was at USC. And of course, everyone knew about um, foregut surgery and Dr. Demister, who was a chairman at the time, the Demister score, uh, Jeff uh, Hagen. Peters. Oh, Jeff Peter, Peters yeah. was a program chair at the time, also very well known for, for foregut surgery. Um, I took my first SAGES course mm -hmm. at USC for foregut. I don't know if they still have their foregut surgery case courses when I was a resident. So you have quite a legacy behind you at USC. And now you're one of the um, premier robotic surgeons there. And you do a lot of hiatal hernia surgeries and foregut surgeries. So I'm really excited to have you because I don't answer a lot of questions about hiatal hernias. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about this topic because it's often, you know, has a lot of patients are often confused about kind of the information out there. And yeah. um, I'm really excited to kind of see what, what patients are wanting to know and shed some light on, on the disease process of hiatal hernias, which is also, you know, a lot of times... Um, correlates with acid reflux as well. So sometimes they go hand in hand. So there may be questions, yeah, maybe talking about acid reflux, hiatal hernias, and kind of, we can talk about why those things tend to uh, be treated similarly. Yeah, absolutely. So um, maybe you can just quickly tell us what is a hiatal hernia? Because a lot of people call my office because they have a hiatal hernia. They're like, okay, hernia surgeon, hiatal hernia, but mm -hmm. It's, it's, a, it's not technically an abdominal wall hernia. It's a little bit deeper. So maybe you can explain like, what's the hiatus? Why is it called hiatal hernia? What yeah. Is, what you do is different than the average general surgeon. Yeah. So the a hiatal hernia is basically a hernia um, in the diaphragm. So the muscle that separates the chest from the abdomen. Um, and a, a hernia basically is just a hole. So anytime there's a hole somewhere in the body, it's called a hernia, but depending on that, it, where it is, is when you have differences. So a hiatal hernia, there's the hiatus of the diaphragm. That's a natural hole in the diaphragm to let the esophagus pass from the, from the chest cavity to the abdomen. But it's, it's considered a hernia when um, stomach pushes up through that hole up into the chest. So then now you have stomach up in the chest where it shouldn't belong. Um, the difference between kind of abdominal wall hernia and foregut or the hiatal hernia is that often you need to go to a foregut specialist or someone that, and what that means, basically foregut is just a fancy word for esophagus and stomach. Someone that works in that area because that area is right behind the heart and it's sandwiched between the yeah. lungs and the heart and the aorta or the major blood vessels of the body. So, and you're working in a small space to try and get that um, stomach back into its normal position. So often it takes a specialist to do that type of hernia surgery. And who are those specialists? If someone wants to see, can they go to a general surgeon or do they have to be specialized? Yeah. So there's a, there are lots, many tracks for doing this type of uh, hernia, but you could be a general surgeon and, and kind of focus your practice in the, in the foregut area or the hiatal hernia area. So a lot of general surgeons or a subset, I should say, of general surgeons do this procedure. 
But as a patient, often what I would look for is someone that does these often, because that's an area of critical um, structures, I would say, or a lot of um, anatomy that is, um, you know, high risk in a way. Um, so you want someone that does a lot of these procedures and is, is very well versed in that area. So usually that is someone who has a uh, MIS or minimally invasive surgery fellowship is a good way to kind of see, yeah. oh, did they do that kind of fellowship? That means they specialize in this area you, for a year afterwards, just focused on doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's lumped with uh, minimally invasive or, or in bariatric together. Sometimes that fellowship uh, covers both. Um, and, and, and then often there's, uh, kind of uh, centers of excellence as well. So more and more, this, um, this idea of a digestive diseases center, center of excellence comes up. Um, and those are kind of um, within a hospital system. Often they designate a certain hospital, or a certain group to be their specialists and have this kind of accreditation of being a center of, a center of excellence. So that's also something to look for as a patient. If you want to make sure that you're going to an experienced surgeon. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know they had a center of excellence for that. Uh, the question is, is a hiatal hernia the same as an epigastric hernia? Um, no, actually. So an epigastric hernia is still in the abdominal wall. So anything that the abdominal wall, we talk about anything visible, like that you can see evolved on your, when you look down at your abdomen, an epigastric is just that area between kind of where the bone, the rib cage is high on the abdomen. That's called the epigastric region. Um, a hiatal hernia is deeper on the inside. Yeah, I'll fix the epigastric hernias. Yeah. <laughs> you fix the hiatal hernias. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely a different, um, I mean, the anatomy is the conceptually the same, like you said, it's a hole, mm -hmm. uh, but it's always a hole where a major organ like the stomach uh, goes through in your situation with the hiatal hernias, whereas abdominal wall, it's usually fat. It can be small intestines, often not other organs. Um, the other major difference, which is, um, is that in the abdominal wall, you can completely close that hole because there you don't have to have anything going through there. So you completely yeah. close that hole and then can cover that with mesh. Yeah. Whereas uh, in a hiatal hernia, you need to leave a small defect. You need to leave the hole so the esophagus can still come through. Right. And so that poses some challenges where you have to close it enough so that um, it doesn't, you know, come, hopefully doesn't come back. Um, but not, not too much that, you know, you can have problems with a swallowing or something like that in that area because you are closing around the esophagus. Yeah. So just to clarify, the anatomy goes, the food goes in your mouth. It goes behind your throat. It goes down the esophagus, which is just a simple long tube. Mm -hmm. And then that's really behind your heart. And then it transitions into the stomach right around like what they call the breastbone, I guess, mm -hmm. below the breastbone. Um, and if you have any problems with the area, usually the pain is around that area, right? Well, somewhere between the breasts and kind of, and lower. Yeah. So it can be in the upper abdomen, like right under the rib cage. Um, sometimes it goes a little bit towards the right side. Um, patients can have heartburn. That's also one of the major symptoms of a hiatal hernia is kind of heartburn. Um, we can talk about why that is. Other minor things can be um, like feeling that food gets stuck or regurgitation of food. Let's say you're, you eat and then you bend over to tie your shoe and you have a little bit of something come into your mouth that's called regurgitation. And that can be a symptom. Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of hard because some of these symptoms, you know, can overlap other things and it's not always a hiatal hernia, but some of those things, if you have acid reflux or that regurgitation food kind of feels like it's come coming up, um, those can be signs of a hiatal hernia. Um, but often uh, in other times they can be completely asymptomatic and patients don't even know they have them. Yeah, that was going to be the next question, which is, how do you know if you have a hiatal hernia? So what percentage of people with hiatal hernias actually have symptoms? Um, probably, a, I would say the major symptom is acid reflux. And um, 
and but there, you know, acid reflux can happen with or without a hiatal hernia. Um, and symptomatic, I would say probably about mm, 60% of patients with a hiatal hernia are symptomatic. A lot of, Whoa. most people are. The issue, what I think it, is that you all, people can tend to, if those symptoms come on gradually, you can kind of make minor little changes and not really realizing that, oh, I'm not, I'm making minor changes in my day. Um, like not eating, eating spicy food as much or not eating late at night so that I don't feel, um, I don't get woken up in the middle of the night with acid reflux. There's little changes that people make and they don't kind of associate it. So I would say more people are symptomatic than not. Yeah. Um, but there are about 40% that are Is, it a, probably is it a U.S. problem? Like, do you, are there a lot of hiatal hernias or acid reflux in like India or China or Africa? Yeah, no, I, I don't think it's just a U.S. problem. I think it's yeah. probably a little bit more prominent here just because of, um, kind of things that we think can contribute to a hiatal hernia. And this is not everything. Some, some of it is genetic and we know that it can run in families, oh, but okay. Other times it's um, uh, anything that increases abdominal pressure. So being overweight, uh, having carrying a lot of your weight in the abdomen, um, heavy lifting, but you know, maybe those are kind of speculations um, of why you get it. Most patients, however, with a hiatal hernia, um, the research shows that they actually have a, a difference in their collagen in the muscle of the diaphragm itself. That yeah predisposes them to have stretching of that, of that hole. So that more, so stomach is more likely to get up there. So it, there is a genetic component as well. Yeah. When I talk to my hernia patients, I do a full history and always ask them about acid reflux or uh, look for hiatal hernias on their imaging, because it's all the same family. Right. And it sounds like doctors for Hiatal hernias are very similar for other hernias. So obesity, um, chronic cough, anything that increases your abdominal pressure. Um, um, nicotine mm -hmm. has that been shown to kind of have a higher risk? It is for hernias. Um, not necessarily. Hernias. I, I haven't heard that one for hiatal okay. hernias specifically. Yeah. And then straining to have a bowel movement. Uh, yep. Like constipation. Men, when they have a large prostate, they're straining uh, yep. against uh, their bladder. And then... Um, yeah, definitely obesity is a big one. And also in the groin and else belly button where you can get hernias, there have been studies that show this kind of mismatch of collagen. So you tend mm -hmm. to have like the weaker collagen, not so much as of the stronger, uh, more mature collagen. And when the collagen is laid down, it's not as perfectly laid in like these perfect patches. And so they don't have the strength um, that you expect. So can you explain... Um, well, you're answering like all the questions before I'm getting to them. <laughs> okay. okay, so the last question was about what is a hiatal hernia? How is it different than other hernias? We discussed that. Yeah. Um, the next is about surgery. So mm -hmm. um, you're a surgeon and I assume you're, you're talking to patients about whether they need surgery, what the pros and cons are. Um, but uh, how do I know if my hiatal hernia needs repair? Yeah. Um, so often before, often before a patient gets to a surgeon, they've had um, some workup done. They know they have a hiatal hernia. And often we know that because either they're symptomatic and they're with acid, let's say it's they're symptomatic with acid reflux. And so their, um, their GI doctor may do a scope or an endoscopy where they look with a camera down through the um, esophagus into the stomach and they notice a hiatal hernia. So that's one way people can know that they have a hiatal hernia. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so that's one way people get to me. Others are, um, they find it on a CT scan that they were getting for something else. So they, those are kind of some more of the asymptomatic patients that have large hiatal hernias. Um, every patient that comes in our, in our door for a surgical consult, if they have a hiatal hernia, we kind of want to know. Um, we need a little bit of a workup before we say, yes, you're a candidate for surgery. So not all hiatal hernias do require surgery. A lot of them do, however, because the hiatal hernia or well, there's a valve between the esophagus and stomach that prevents acid reflux and prevents, um, injury to the, to the esophagus from acid. Right. So, 
um, often if that valve is up in the chest, it's not working appropriately. Um, so it can contribute to some of those symptoms, which although acid reflux, you know, can be treated with antacids or medication um, and other things, if the hiatal hernia is there, you're never really going to solve the problem because yeah. it's a, it's a mechanical or structural issue. Yeah. Um, so we want to know, do you have acid reflux? How bad is it? Um, what, how does it, how does the hernia kind of affect your daily life? And some of the testing we do as an endoscopy, sometimes we do a, a quantitative or a pH test to see like how much acid is really coming into your esophagus. And oftentimes we'll do some kind of imaging or x-ray study where you drink some dye and we watch it go through to know, um, to screen for the motility of your esophagus. So if we're considering you for surgery, we want to know that your esophagus squeezes well, because we're going to, part of the hernia surgery, which I'm going to describe in a minute, is um, recreating a valve between the esophagus and stomach. And we do that because once we bring right. the esophagus out of the chest, um, and it's now down in the proper place in the abdomen, that valve, that sphincter muscle that usually would protect you from acid reflux, um, it doesn't work anymore. Um, it just kind of loses its function from being up in the, in the chest. So two parts of the surgery, if you are a candidate, is that we bring the stomach down in the right place. There's a hole in the diaphragm that I told you was too big and we need to narrow that down. So it's just big enough for the esophagus to come through. So yeah. we stitch that diaphragm up and then the second part of the surgery is to reinforce the valve. And there's options for that. Um, and, and your surgeons will go over kind of what the best options for you, how tight you reinforce it based on how well your um, esophagus or your anatomy can squeeze food down past a valve. Um, so that's kind of the basics. You know, a lot of, if you have a large hiatal hernia and large is relative. So I would say if it's measured like four to seven centimeter, four to 10, anything above, well, anything above six, I would say is large. Moderate, yeah. I would say is probably a four to six range. Yeah. And then small hiatal hernias um, are probably in the two to four range. Mm -hmm. um, all of them can be symptomatic. You could have a huge hernia and be asymptomatic, have a really small hernia, and, and have all the symptoms in the world. It doesn't yeah. necessarily correlate. Um, but often if patients have large hernias, we wanna get those fixed because there's some complications of having your stomach up in your chest. Um, it doesn't it can, belong there. No, it doesn't belong there. You can get shortness of breath, it can twist. Um, there's something, you know, we'd rather have it down in the, in the abdomen where it should be so we prevent some of those complications. Um, and then, yeah. And then for the smaller ones, we, and the moderate ones, we're looking to make, see if they're symptomatic and if they're symptomatic, we consider fixing those for patients. Good. So the next question is a good, good, uh, leeway into it is what are the symptoms of a hiatal hernia? Can you get discomfort under the breast that moves to the center of the chest that then becomes like spasms from both sides of the ribs, then severe pain and nothing seems mm -hmm. to help including ice or heat. This only came on when sitting or driving in the car. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of a thing. Some, some symptoms overlap. So yeah, I mean, could that be a symptom of a hiatal hernia? Yeah, it could be. You could have kind of this pain or shortness of breath or, um, positional, um, discomfort. Yeah. Uh, can I say a hundred percent without doing any testing that that is a hiatal hernia? No, but it's, but it could be. Um, and it just, it requires that type of symptom requires maybe some workup and x-ray study would be a simple thing to start, start with just to see if your anatomy is normal. If, if that's suspected, so um, the same, the same follow-up is once the bad pain comes in, I mm -hmm. have had two episodes where I felt that, like a fist sized knot in my chest, about three inches in size. And the mm -hmm. ne next time I happened, it seemed to be a six inch area. I finally got to a doctor and he wants to do an endoscopy, which I've had in the past. And I know I have a hiatal hernia, but it's been many years. I also have acid reflux. Three mm -hmm. doctors said they don't think a hiatal hernia would cause the symptoms I have. 
you know, it's hard to, you know, pain is a hard symptom to directly correlate to something. Yeah. We know that a hiatal hernia can cause discomfort. It can cause discomfort in the chest and in patient, the, the, the thing that's, you know, patients experience their symptoms and their body a little differently. Yeah. So could it be what I would say to a patient that has a hiatal hernia, has acid reflux, and is experiencing that type of pain, discomfort? Mm-hmm. It's like, listen, you, you know, given, let's say the workup says that you're a pretty good candidate for surgery. Um, let's fix that abnormal anatomy. And there's a good chance that pain does go away. Um, and if it doesn't, then we fix your anatomy. You don't have acid reflux. You don't have to worry about the hernia. And we could consider, then we have to think about other, other things that could be contributing to the pain or, or discomfort. But, um, you know, there's a, after kind of teasing and talking to a patient, it's and asking specific questions. Yeah. Um, often we can tease out, you know, whether it's probable that that would be something that could happen from acid reflux. Part of the teasing. So if you do endoscopy, which is camera down the throat, looking at the esophagus mm-hmm. and the, the stomach and it's clean, like, yeah, you have a hiatal hernia, but there's no inflammation. There's no burning. There's no acid kind of evidence of like esophagitis, which is kind of yeah. like burning or inflammation of the lining. Does that imply that you don't have pain from a hiatal hernia or can you have pain from a hiatal hernia and, and have a normal endoscopy except for the hiatal hernia? Yeah, um, you can. That's probably a little more rare to have mm-hmm. like that intense pain from a hiatal hernia. Um, not to say it can't happen, but it's, it's a little more rare. Um, the other thing that I would say is if on, on a simple endoscopy and you, let's say the mucosa or the lining of the, the anatomy looks normal, yeah. Oftentimes, if patients are complaining of symptoms that sound like they're from acid reflux or from a hiatal hernia, that's when I would do a pH test to actually put okay. a probe inside the esophagus um, to, to monitor how much acid is, is coming up. Um, it gives us a score, um, the Demeester score. We talked about Tom Demeester. Uh, he, yeah. he developed that. He's from USC. Um, but it gives you a score to say, yeah, actually, you know what, you're an ad- you have a hiatal hernia and although it's not causing a lot of like visual injury, you actually have a lot of reflux and that may be worth getting fixed. So there's a lot of little nuances and, and tailoring the surgery to a patient's needs. Right. And then, so that, that probe is a, or a pH probe is outpatient study, correct? Yes. So it's actually, it's a wireless, it's like the size of, you know, a little pencil eraser and it, mm-hmm. during an endoscopy, um, we clip it into the esophagus about six centimeters above where your valve is or should be. Yeah. And then you have a wire, a monitor that you wear in it and you, it tracks it wirelessly for four days. And then you bring oh, back cool. the monitor and we're able to see like a tracing of how often and give you a score um, that tells us if you've had acid reflux or not. And if you, yeah. And it's a really, it's a really great test because it's for those patients that maybe have a small hiatal hernia, but not a lot of injury from reflux visually. Um, and it, you know, it can kind of clarify if those symptoms are from reflux or if it's something else for us. And then, um, what if they just take a bunch of antacids and is that a good predictor of whether their hiatal hernia is the cause of their pain? So if you take antacids, so, um, you know, antacids are basically a uh, medication that we give to patients that have acid reflux to decrease mm-hmm. the amount of heartburn or how much acid is in their stomach and can decrease the, yeah, the acid in your stomach. Um, they're great for a lot of patients. They're, they're, they work really well and it takes away your symptoms and you can kind of live your normal life. Right. Um, but often patients are on these medications chronically and continuing to take them and take them and take them. And they're not quite, they're helping their symptoms, but they're not making them go away. And they're still having nagging symptoms on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, those that's what we call breakthrough symptoms. So if you're on the medication that you should be on and you're still having symptoms, even if maybe they're not as bad, some then, you know, we need to look into you know, maybe we should get it fixed surgically. Um, there are patients that just don't want to be on medications every day of their life and, you know, have a hiatal hernia and, and need 
or want to get it fixed. And we talk to patients um, like that as well. There's a lot of media about antacids being bad for you. Yeah. Um, so, and I kind of, you know, the risk for an individual is pretty small. For a healthy individual, the risk of the antacids, even being on them longer, you know, some people are on them for five, 10 years. I think the label says three months only. Um, but, you know, people are on these and they're controlling their symptoms for many years. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, a lot of fear, I think, from the media recently. And I kind of, yes, there are some side effects. Um, and depending on what your other medical issues, it might be an issue for you versus someone else. Um, but overall, they're relatively safe. And, you know, the risk of surgery has some risk to it too. So it's always kind of weighing the benefit and the risk of staying on a medication versus kind of the risks, inherent risks of surgery. So yeah, 10, 20 years ago, there were studies showing concern that if you're on these anti-ulcer medications for a long time, you can get gastric cancer, uh, kind of like a high elevating ga gastro mm -hmm. levels and so on. But um, I think the more recent studies show that that is not the case. Do you know anything about the risk of gastric cancer with like Nexium, Prelacin, yeah. Pepsid? Most of them are, there's not a risk of gastric cancer. There was one, Zantac was taken off the market for a little while and I think they changed the formula and I think it's back. Yeah. Um, but Zantac was off for a while because of a known, because of a risk that was proven. But mm -hmm. all the rest of them, I, I don't, think that I've seen that, um, come up again, um, as a, as a risk of them. Yeah. Okay. The next question is, do asymptomatic congenital hiatal hernias exist? And if yes, and you have it, will it worsen with time and become symptomatic if you ignore it? It can. Um, yeah, so they do exist and they can be asymptomatic. Um, we kind of think that oh, most hernias over time are likely going to get larger. Okay. Um, but I, would you agree with that statement? Yeah. It's just, yeah. we don't know how fast that trajectory right. is. It could be exactly. one year, it could be 10 years or 20 years. Exactly. So we just don't know how long for each patient that's going to take. So what I would say is if, if you know, you have a hiatal hernia and it's asymptomatic and yeah. surgery is not really needed for you because you're, you're not having any bad side effects from the hernia, I would put that patient on a surveillance type of program where they get a, an imaging study or some kind of study periodically. It might be three years. It might be five years, you know, depending on how big the hernia is to start with. Mm -hmm. um, if it's really small and the symptoms don't change, we can just periodically look at it because we don't know how fast it could change and it might not change for a really long time. And that patient may not need surgery. Yeah. If they have a larger, if it's a large hernia, when we find out about it, most of the time I'm probably going to recommend that we fix that hernia mm -hmm. um, while someone's kind of young and healthy and before it gets worse. Cause if it's already large, you know, that six, seven, eight, nine centimeter range, then likely fixing it early is going to be a better strategy. Next question is about imaging. So what's the best imaging for a hiatal hernia outside of endoscopy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say an endoscopy is the best. Well, it gives you a lot of information kind of from the inside, whether the hiatal hernia, how big it is, you can measure it. You can see the, um, if you're having injury on of the mucosal side from it, the other thing often we get is called a video esophagram or an esophagram, and that's drinking some dye and watching it go through. Um, that can, that often is also done, um, in conjunction and during the workup and making for a patient, they'll get that and an endoscopy. Um, and that is to kind of see the configuration in real time. When you swallow, does your esophagus move, right? Is your, um, is, is the dye that we have you drink going down, hitting a point kind of refluxing back Ooh. up? Is it going yeah. through normally? Just What's like happening? Food. Yeah, what's happening dynamically, which we can't see when you're asleep, and we just put a scope in there. Um, and then some, then some subset of patients will also need a study, which I guess this is kind of getting into the details, but some patients will need a manometry, which is a study that actually looks at the squeezing of the esophagus. So Function. if, yep, we need to know if we are considering that someone for surgery, 
And let's say on their imaging study, on that x-ray study, it looks like their esophagus may not squeeze very well. Um, we wanna know whether it does or doesn't. And, and um, so sometimes we need a functional study where we have a probe in there and then have patients follow and it gives us measurements of the actual pressures of the esophagus so we can decide whether how tight to reinforce a valve for that sphincter. Can you see patient. a can you see a hiatal hernia on CT scan or a CAT scan? You can. Yeah. You can. Yes, you can see it. Um, and all, you know sometimes that's how a patient finds out about it because mm -hmm. um, they get a CT scan for something else and they're like, oh, we see a hiatal hernia there. Yeah. And all, and honestly, oftentimes it's downplayed at that point. Like you may be told, and you're like, oh, don't worry about it. It's small. Nothing to do about that. Yeah. And that can be true. But at the same time, if you're having symptoms from it, or if it's a certain, over a certain size, that may not be true for everyone. Or if that's um, why you got the CT scan, because you got this weird pain in the, in the upper abdomen, like a knife-like sharp pain in the yeah. lower area, that's probably... Yeah, that, that, and yeah. there's nothing else on there, it's probably from the hiatal hernia. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And then the video esophagram, where they drink the contrast and you watch it go down from your esophagus to your stomach and if it refluxes up does that mimic what happens when you take food in yeah it does um we'll do liquid and then often they'll give you a little tablet as well that will simulate more solids so it's kind of what happens with liquids what happens with the solids um and it you know yeah it does it'll mimic what happens when you swallow food or liquid okay cool so we already talked about the genetic component. There is, it does run in families, mm -hmm. just like other hernias, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, it does. So um, we think that there is a genetic component. I think we touched on that with kind of that collagen, depth of the collagen can be a different type. You're not gonna know that. A patient, you're not gonna know if your collagen is different. Right. That's more of a kind of something that's been studied in the past, but um, patients not going to necessarily know if you have more of one type of collagen than, than the other. Um, and then, but we and, and for regular hernias, not only does it run in families, we've been able to show that it's actually a stronger link if a female in your family has it than a male. It's something that I started seeing in my patients where there was a stronger genetic link if it was like a mom mm -hmm. than a dad, even though women tend to are less likely to have uh, abdominal wall hernias than men, but um, what do you see in, in hiatal hernias? Is it more common in men or women? Um, not necessarily, no. Uh, well, I guess they do say in, they do say that it's slightly more in men. Um, they do, I guess they should rephrase, yes. Um, they tend to say that it's more likely in men and more likely in that kind of 50 year old age group. Mm -hmm. But that being said, um, I don't always, in my experience, that's not necessarily what I see. I see a pretty equal distribution, honestly, of yeah. men and women. Um, and yeah, that's interesting that you found that about the female uh, bloodline, I guess. Mm -hmm. I haven't necessarily seen that in hiatal hernias, but I don't know that I've been kind of maybe been that observant either. So yeah, it's less common in women, but if it isn't a female, that bloodline is stronger to be passed yeah. on. Yeah. That's kind interesting. Of yeah. Okay. Going back to, um, so let's start with a little bit of non-surgical stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, most of the symptoms from a hiatal hernia are acid reflux or, or GERD, right? Gastroesophageal mm -hmm. yep. reflux disease. Although you did hint on like obstruction and other really bad complications that can occur probably in the larger hernias, but, um, is there a way to naturally cure a hernia of the hiatus or to at least treat the symptoms without using prescription medication? Or you know, um, yeah, I, I would say there's no way to cure a hiatal hernia. That's a structural abnormality in your body. And mm -hmm. you can, um, you could, you can try and kind of prevent it from getting worse, but honestly, um, and that can work. So some of the strategies to try and prevent it from getting worse would be um, to kind of keep any that intra-abdominal uh, pressure down. So um, losing weight, trying to avoid extreme constipation or heavy lifting, 
coughing yeah. if you have a major coughing issue but anything that increases abdominal pressure we think can can contribute to um making hiatal hernias worse one thing i want to caution is that i wouldn't i'm not saying like stop exercising i you're you're safe. Like most patients with hiatal hernias are going to exercise and it's not going to change it. I'm talking about like really heavy, like weightlifting where you're really increasing the intra-abdominal pressure. Um, and you know, I think that there are ways to kind of decrease the symptoms, um, avoiding certain foods, uh, acidic foods can help some patients and avoiding your triggers eating, not eating late at night, because when you lay down, if you don't have a valve in place, then that can kind of flow more easily up into the esophagus. Um, there are some, you know, I don't know. Yeah. There's not a lot of natural kind of remedies. There's some, there are On things TikTok, out there about like, acid reflux. I know TikTok there's hundreds. a lot of them. <laughs> I know there are hundreds and hundreds. Um, I don't know if they're proven. That's yeah. the thing. And if you yeah. have a structural abnormality, you know, it's probably what I often tell patients is, you know, you're probably not changing the amount of reflux that's coming up because your valve is abnormal. So that you're going to have reflux. Um, and, but you can change your, how you, how you respond to it. Like, um, you may not change the acid reflux or the amount, but like at antacids make the secretions less acidic. So you're not feeling it as much. Have you heard you know, about the vinegar? They say you should have like apple vinegar. Cider vinegar. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've heard that and I just, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm seeing no scientific studies that would prove that that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Though, um, and then what, what about uh, like carbonated drinks and mm -hmm. coffee and tea that's caffeinated are all those, those all can kind of exacerbate reflux, right? Because yeah. They can. So okay. caffeinated, I mean, it's like everything good that you want to eat. If you think right. about <laughs> fat, chocolate, caffeine, <laughs> um, overeating, like overstuffed meals, um, tomato sauce for Ital good Italian meals, you know, wine, uh, those can all kind of make acid reflux worse. And man, you could like avoid everything. Um, but certain patients tend to have certain tri triggers um, that may make their reflux worse and kind of avoiding some of those can, can help. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different foods that can kind of contribute to acid reflux. Um, carbonated, I think is more about the, um, kind of stretching of the, the bubbles and the gas and kind of over distension of the stomach, which can mm -hmm. kind of, if you think about if you increase the pressure within the stomach with that gas, then you're likely pushing more upwards on the chest. And if you're constantly burping, does that imply you have a hiatal hernia? Um, not necessarily. I, I mean, you know, in one patient, yes, you may have one another patient, you may not. So it's not one of those typical symptoms, but it can. Um, yeah, a lot of symptoms for in an individual, for one person, it could happen. Could that be that you have increased burping? You could, but it's not indicative, I would say, of a hiatal hernia. Got it. Um, let's talk about surgery. So you already embarked on uh, mentioning a little bit just the whole concept, which is it's a hole, you got to close the hole, and there are different surgical approaches. You're a big proponent of robotic surgery. We had a whole session mm -hmm. on robotic surgery last week with Andrea nice. Piccola. Oh, so yeah. That was nice. really, really fun. Um, we've had a couple others in the past, too, about just robotics, um, uh, just fun talks. I love robotic surgery because it's fun, but yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> not one that like promotes it for every single thing. Um, some people always do robotic surgery, some do nothing and others like I'm kind of in between. Um, yeah. But I know that you're a big component of robotic surgery and that's a lot of what you do. So um, is, it, is it fair to say that if you have the opportunity to either have laparoscopic or robotic surgery that you should choose that option as opposed to like open surgery, assuming that you're offered both. Yes, for sure. Um, and actually most foregut procedures, um, if you're going to go and see a surgeon for elective repair, it's going to be minimally invasive, meaning small incisions. Um, it's going to be laparoscopic or robotic. Um, 
there are not a lot, I, I wouldn't, I would say almost no one is doing those open electively. If mm -hmm. they're in an emergent situation where you come in and there's a big issue because something happened to the stomach, you know, those are rare, rare cases. Those maybe will be done open, but in the elective setting, meaning it's planned, yeah. um, it's it's 99% of the time going to be offered a minimally invasive approach. So either laparoscopic or robotic. Um, I do mostly robotic. Um, and you know, I think surgery is kind of, there's technology is kind of entering the world of surgery more and more. What I like about robotic surgery is, um, you know, we're operating in a small space. The, the diaphragm is small and we have to go through the small space to kind of dissect in the chest and kind of, yeah. and bring the hernia down. And there's critical structures there. So for me, the, the, really the benefit of robotics during the surgery is, um, visualization and stability of the camera. Um, mm -hmm. you, it takes out tremor. Yeah. So, and then the other thing is you have these wristed instruments, so I can kind of use a wristed instrument to get in tight spaces, whereas traditional laparoscopy is straight sticks. So I often say it's like operating with chopsticks. We've gotten really good at that. We've trained that way for years and years and years. And in order to offer minimally invasive surgery, we can do very complex surgeries that way. And there are yeah. expertly skilled surgeons that, and that's the way I was trained. I was trained laparoscopically, but the robot kind of gives us our freedom and our flexibility back, um, which I really like to kind of keep surgery as precise as possible. And then as far as the patients, I do see a little less pain a little less their incisions hurt a little bit less they tend to bounce back from surgery just a little bit better um and so i really do think it's for for the foregut area i do think it's benefit and then uh when you do repair you know in in abdominal wall hernias we use mesh mm -hmm. and it's uh i believe we're overusing mesh but it is mm -hmm. a very critical tool that we have in trying to fix abdominal wall hernias, especially the larger ones, what is the role of mesh for the hiatal, for the hiatus and hiatal hernias? Yeah. Um, so mesh is, um, I would, I hesitate to say a controversial talk, topic mm -hmm. in hiatal hernias, but it's, it's debated. I should say it's yeah. not controversial. It's debated. And the reason it's debated is because, um, based on our scientific literature, there, there were papers early on when we started using mesh that said it helped recur, uh, reduce um, recurrence rates. So reduce how often those hernias came back in yeah. the same individual. Um, and so initially everyone was like, oh my gosh, this is so great. We can reduce this hernia from coming back by using this mesh. The, the issue was that um, that was true for the first six months to a year after surgery. But then if you followed those patients at five or 10 years, the patients who got mesh or didn't have mesh had the same kind of rate of recurrence or that hernia coming back. Um, and so long-term it didn't pan out to prevent a hernia from coming back. That's so weird. Um, yeah. So I will use it selectively. Um, I'll use it when the diaphragm, you can think about a hole being narrow or a teardrop shape, or it can be like a big oval and so if there's some tension or there's some, like I'm pulling, sewing up the diaphragm and there's kind of some tension on it, um, I like to reinforce with mesh um, because it'll kind of allow, uh, protect that area for the short term in that first six to months to a year while the tissue is weakened um, and I, it gives it extra structural support. So I will use it in those patients. I know that long-term, I can't predict who may get a, a recurrent hernia or who won't. Um, mm -hmm. The recurrence rate, I'm just going to jump into this because it might be a follow-up question about, okay, yeah, it's well, already been asked. Yeah. What yeah. Is the, why do they come back? Rate? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what is the recurrence rate? So nationally, I would say the recurrence rate is like 20%. And that sounds high. high yeah. Um you know, but we're, um, fixing kind of reconstructing an area that moves and it's dynamic and it has to, you have to leave a hole that, ha you know, so it's kind of this art, right. Um, and 
the caveat to that is that about 20%, right? That's the, the number that's thrown out there. Mm -hmm. In centers that do these, or expert centers, or so in expert hands, that rate goes down a little bit. It's about 15%. Mm -hmm. And then there's also, it breaks down between the patients who have recurrence that need it repaired or a recurrent surgery or another surgery to help repair it. Yep. And usually that's about five to any quote quoted five to 10% um, at five to 10 years after so the initial surgery. But the majority of those people that recur don't necessarily need another surgery. They just need maybe new medication or modification yeah. or lifestyle. Yeah. So sometimes those are asymptomatic recurrences. So they don't, patients don't even know about it, but we like to follow our patients and make sure that the, you know, that this is a durable surgery. So we tend yeah. to follow patients over time. Um, sometimes, you know, so sometimes we find them that way. And a lot of times it's a big, the patients that are tend to be more at risk for her, a recurrence are the ones that have a big hernia on the outset onset. Um, and, you know, maybe have some of those external factors like intra-abdominal pressure, um, or genetics could not be on our side. Um, and those, you know, those are a little risky or have a little more of recurrence rate than the smaller ones, but they tend to, if they come back, they tend to come back smaller. So if you had a six, seven centimeter, I mean, this isn't all the time. It's kind of the rule of thumb though. Usually they'll come back and be like maybe one to two centimeters. So we find it radiographically or on imaging. And then we have to tease out whether it's symptomatic or actually causing any issue for the patient. So I've learned is that we actually have really great medications nowadays. So, and most of what used to be prescription is now over the counter, like Prolisec, Nexium, mm -hmm. Pepsid, uh, Omeprazole. These are all prescription when I was a resident um, or even came out after I was a resident. And now they're over the counter medications. Yeah. So in terms of symptom control and uh, acid reflux kind of medical treatment, those medications seem to be pretty damn good. Do you notice that that's reduced the need for surgery? And that's one question. And then the second mm -hmm. question is, what are the risks of this pineal hernia surgery? Yeah, um, the medication is good for a lot of patients. The one thing I worry about, honestly, is that it's so available. Yeah. And acid reflux, I mean, it seems like it's just an annoyance, but um, what a lot of patients don't know is that acid reflux is actually the number one precursor to esophageal cancer mm. and left untreated or left undertreated without kind of medical supervision, it can progress because you could be, um, you know, taking the medication and not feeling anything, you know, not feeling the symptoms of heartburn anymore. And yet on the inside, you could have major issues. And so I, I caution like, yes, they are great and they could might work really well for you for a long time. Yeah. But I also think that you should work with a medical provider to make sure you're not in a higher risk subset of patient with acid right. reflux. Um, the prevalence of high of esophageal cancer has gone up tremendously in the last 25 years. And, yeah. um, and I don't know that, I mean, that, I don't think that's very common knowledge that there's a direct link between acid reflux and esophageal cancer. Yeah. not to scare patients. Most patients will never get that, you know, it's not, but that's why I caution against just treating it over the counter on your own and yeah. making sure that you're working with a medical provider, even if the medication is what, what you end up needing. Um, this, the surgery is not, I would say it's not very risky in, um, kind of expert hands and patient and, and surgeons that are doing this often, the, the surgical risk is, is pretty minimal. Um, it's minimally invasive, small incisions. Um, what you'll probably be quoted minimal risk of really minimal risk of bleeding, yeah. minimal risk of injury. The biggest risk I would say is, um, you know, there's always some risk of anesthesia with any procedure and things like that, like that they talk about, right? but it's, it's so small, but yeah. So that's the thing. I think the biggest risk is that, um, we need to know, we need to tailor the surgery for what you need. So the cookie cutter surgeon, that's going to say anyone with acid reflux that comes through my door needs one procedure, Nissen yeah. fundification, let's say, or to pay fundification or one thing, yeah. you know, 
I, I worry that, you know, then we're not tailoring to the patient's needs. Um, so I, you know, in our institution, we, we, well, we like to get those studies and really talk to a patient about multiple options. Mm -hmm. um, those options sometimes are using your stomach and wrapping around and we can wrap all the way around 360, that's a Nissen. We can wrap it partially, which is a 270 wrap and that's called a toupee fundification. We have a device called a Lynx, which is a magnetic ring that can help reinforce the valve. And then there's even an endoscopic option where you can go in and um, through a scope like we did when we were looking to see if you have a hiatal hernia and reinforce the valve from the inside. Mm -hmm. And there's all little, you know, whether you're a candidate for one or the other kind of there's little nuances that make you uh, a candidate for one versus another. But the swallowing afterwards can be an issue. Um, the most common side effects of the procedure, which is what you know, you want to balance is, is a uh, gas float or feeling kind of gassy because you've reinforced this valve. And so you can't burp or vomit as well anymore. So most of that goes downwards. So you patients can feel gassy afterwards. And then the risk of weak dysphagia, which is a fancy word for kind of trouble swallowing yeah. where it, you know, the, this, you eat food. Now you have this really robust, nice valve, but preventing reflux from coming up, but it can be difficult to get the food down. That's about, you know, 10% of patients can have some degree of dysphagia. Mm -hmm. Most, most of the time that's in the, in the, um, recovery phase after surgery in the first three months where you you're not used to having a valve. Now you have a really strong valve. Um, there's swelling, the scar tissue, and that all we know as we heal that swelling goes away, the scar tissue remodels and softens, um, the diaphragm stretches a little bit. So often, you know, there, that subset of patients that can have problems it, initially after surgery slowly gets better over time and nothing has to be done. Yeah. There's a small subset of patients that struggle more than that and may need some kind of um, treatment like a, a dilation where you stretch the valve out afterwards to try and break up the scar tissue to help them swallow better. But it's important to know ahead of time um, kind of what your anatomy is doing so we can try and prevent that as much as possible. And what's your thought about applying weight loss surgery for people that are obese and have hiatal hernia, mm -hmm. acid reflux, et cetera. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think it's a great idea, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, uh, patients that are obese, let's say are overweight and um, have hiatal hernias. If we just fix the hiatal hernia, but to do nothing about that excess weight, yeah. And you still have all that abdominal pressure that's going to make you a little higher chance of having a recurrent hernia or that hernia come back and need to have another procedure down the line. Which is not and good. then, yeah, and we just, we, we want to try and prevent that if we can. So, and then we also know that, um, a gastric bypass surgery, which is the same surgery that you can get for weight loss is, um, great for end stage, uh, reflux. So even in normal weight individuals that have severe reflux, if they've gotten, um, a, let's say a surgery for it and this in, and they recurred and they still have horrible reflux and we've tried other things, then our last resort is for those or not last, but, um, is a, a gastric bypass. That yeah. is a great anti-reflux surgery. So often if a patient is in the category that could qualify for bariatric surgery and have a hiatal hernia, I often kind of have a conversation to them about, Hey, we could like a fix your hernia, get your acid reflux control in the best way possible, give you a least amount of recurrence rate or chances of it coming back and mm -hmm. kind of treat some of those other comorbidities that often are other medical conditions that often are associated with being overweight, like uh, sleep apnea or um, diabetes. Uh, some of those other things we can treat the whole patient instead of just chip shotting. Oh, this is for this. And this is for that. So, um, I think it's a great thing to consider. Someone's asking about the links, uh, the mm -hmm. ring you put around, um, does it always require general anesthesia? 
It does because it's surgical procedure. Um, and we always, you know, we need to fix you. We fix the hernia and then we put the links on, even if we just put the links on, um, because we're going intra abdominally, we do have to have general anesthesia. Okay. And then a question about medications. Some patients are very sensitive to medications. They have allergies to everything. Uh, mm -hmm. they have muscle activation syndrome, uh, and so on. So is there a way to compound their medications for acid reflux to, or should they go straight to surgery? Like what if you don't tolerate the medications? Yeah. I mean, if you don't, yeah, if you don't tolerate the medications, then, um, surgery is a, in an op, it, it's an option for those patients. And we do have patients like that where they just can't tolerate the medications and, um, and structurally they have an abnormality and we can fix that. Um, and then I would say otherwise dietary lifestyle changes can be tried. Like I said, kind of eating less at night, um, or uh, earlier before bedtime, not lying flat, sleeping propped up. I mean, those things can help reduce symptoms. They might not make them go away completely, but if you're not quite ready or a, can't, it's not severe enough for maybe surgical intervention, you could go that route too. But often, you know, surgery is something to consider if your valve is really abnormal, then it can, it can definitely help prevent those symptoms and, and lead to a better quality of life. Yeah, I think one of the takeaway points that you mentioned is really key, which is not to ignore your acid reflux. If it's due to a mechanical problem, like the door is open for things to move up, mm -hmm. uh, which is a hypo hernia, then you may require surgery um, or some other more drastic measures than just, you know, popping some Tums or taking Pepsin. And then um, if you've if you're ignoring your acid reflux for years and years and years, you're at risk of burning that lining and, mm -hmm. you know, esophageal cancer is something that you brought up. And, and for whatever reason, the rate's going up. Do we know why the rate's going up? You know, we don't know for sure. Um, I, you know, we know that there's a link and there are, there are more pa patients with acid reflux. Mm. You know, one of the theory, one of the theories, which I don't know that it's necessarily been proven, but is that, patients are, are taking the medication, but they're ignoring, they're uh, not following up with medical providers. So yeah. they're self-treating can, can, you know, there's one paper that shows that if you take antacids twice a day, that actually your cancer risk goes up. Yeah. Um, and that's not because the, the antacids cause cancer. It's, it's because, because those patients think they're doing the right thing. They don't feel it anymore. So they think they're fine. And yet, if, even though you don't feel it, sometimes you can, it can still be causing injury on the inside. That's why right. I really think working with a medical provider is important when treating this dynamic disease. And it's the thing about GERD and um, hiatal hernias is that there's no one answer, mm -hmm. which I think you probably have heard me say there's this spectrum. So, um, you know, it's this whole spectrum of disease from moderate to severe and we really have to tease out where you are, where your disease state is so that we can recommend surveillance and medications or, you know, or, you know, you're, you're going to be fine in reassurance or surgical intervention. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's true as well for, for hernias, but I think that when you go to a specialist or a set of excellence, they're probably more uh, adapted kind of tailoring it to the needs yeah. Um, same with hernias. I just saw a patient early today and, um, she's actually from uh, another state and they do have like great hernia surgeons, but she went to this like group that called themselves a hernia center, but they really only do one operation. Mm -hmm. over and, over and, you know, she's female, so that's a different operation. She has, uh, she's thin so that, you know, there's a different, uh, algorithm for thin patients, for females, for the type of hernia that she had and, um, you know, her nerves should not be cut. Well, they always cut the nerves. She doesn't mm -hmm. need mesh. They always use mesh. You know, the, that's just, she kind of understood that maybe she needs something tailored to her. Yeah. So I feel like the same is true for most operations, but I think hiatal hernia surgery, you know, one of the reasons I don't do it, um, is I wasn't trained at USC. I worked there. So I was, mm -hmm. it was very clear that, 
as a general surgeon, you get trained to do them, but it, it's really a very specialized to be able to not harm patients and not make them crippled uh, by doing too tight or too loose of a, of a repair. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very, it's highly, I don't offer it because you do so much better at it than I would ever do. So it's just not fair to kind of say I do all hernias when really I think foregut surgery is, it's a hernia technically, but it's really a foregut mm -hmm. anatomy and um, foregut mechanics are very different than like abdominal wall. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that is a specialized region of the, the body. And I like what you said about kind of tailoring it. And, um, you know, I, I would caution if you go to someone and they're like, I, every, you know, you get one surgery, every patient you're instead of kind of the doctor kind of figuring out what the patient needs is like, yeah. I do this one thing. So every patient that comes to me is a candidate for this one thing, you yeah. know? And, um, yeah, that just doesn't work. I think in today's medicine, medical world, you know, where we have options and we really need to try and use them. Yeah, totally agree. Patients. Well, I told you before we started, the hour goes by really quickly. It does. So it does. We're all done. We had so much fun. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I, it's such a passion to treat patients and in this area of, yeah. of the body and it is so nuanced and I dedicate my, most of my practice to really learning these nuances. So I really uh, hope that our patients and our community has learned something and uh, gets the, the help they need. So thank I you love so it. much. I, I love bringing on people like you that really love what they do and are really good at it. So thank yeah. you for joining me. I know you have family and work mm -hmm. and everything else to get to. So I do appreciate you volunteering your time to help answer all the questions that were submitted today, which were great. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, you know, answer the questions and also kind of clarify what's best for these very unique hernias that, that occur for our patients. Yeah. So absolutely. on that note, everyone, thank you. We will see you next week with another guest. I really love having everyone on and thanks to everyone for joining. Mm -hmm. I will see you later and I hope to see you at Sages pretty soon. Yeah.